Well, hello there. Welcome to Mercy Online. My name is Alan Oro here. I'm the student director here. And we are so excited that you are gathering with us this morning. With me in the studio is... Jack Guthrie, technical director here at Mercy Church. How you doing today, brother? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a crazy run up to Easter when you work for a church, as yes. I'm sure you know. But it's exciting knowing that we're going to have a bunch of services. We've got Good Friday, the extravaganza. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. But yes. it's tiring and it's exciting. So I'm... It's tired. <laughs> Easter is the Christian event or the Christian. I mean, I think it's the event the, for the whole world. For the whole world. Right? Yeah. Yes. I love Easter. You love Easter. I, love I, I cannot tell. So maybe we should just get into it. So Easter, this, <laughs> this week, like next weekend. Yes. We got Good Friday. Good Friday service. What time is it? That's 530 and 7 o'clock here at Providence Road okay. only uh, and online at those same times. Fantastic. And then do we have um, Resurrection Sunday service? So we have Easter Sunday. Um, that's going to be here at 11 outside. So come one, come all, socially distant or bunch up in the front like some people like to do. Um, 11, 11 a.m. I say 11 p.m. 11 a.m. Um, and then at our Mercy Northeast campus is yes. the official public launch of Mercy Northeast. Do and do that's do. going to be at, they got two services. Four. At four and 545. 5.45 and 4 p.m. in the Northeast Quadrant. You can see those at mercycharlotte.com slash news. And the online service will be at 10.30 a.m. on Easter Sunday. So a lot of things I just threw out there. You can rewind a little bit or <laughs> you go to mercycharlotte.com slash Easter. Um, and in between those two things, yes, we got the extravaganza. Extravaganza. Which I think you know all about. If you got all the kids, bring them to church, Providence Road. You can uh, have them pick all the eggs. I think the eggs are stuffed with candy. Can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Not in front of the kids. <laughs> kids, the eggs are stuffed with goodness. <laughs> so make sure you bring all your kids. By the way, Easter uh, Friday, Good Friday, going on to Sunday, these are the best times to invite your friend, your yeah. neighbor, your one, the person mm -hmm. you've been praying for, who's closest to you but far away from God. This is the best time. And yeah. we're going to have outside services. So they don't have to be afraid about social distancing and all that. You can have all the space in the world. Yeah. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, so I would even right now, you can get started. You can uh, text a friend right now to join us here. And that just gives you more reason to text them next week to come to Easter. And they'll hear today a little bit of a lead up into what was kind of the, the trial of Jesus before, mm. uh, before Good Friday. And by the way, today, Pastor Scott is preaching. Yeah, I'm excited for that. It's going to be uh, an our series, Death and Resurrection, Why Jesus Had to Die. And we are going to be in the trial. 
Yeah. Jesus is going to be tried. Yeah, that's a tense scene. It's a tense scene. We're going to be in it. So be right here. If you're new with us, we are so glad that you're here. Could you please go to the chat and write your name on there? Let us know where you are fellowshipping with us from. And we would love to get back to you. I'm sure Jessica, who's not here with us today, she's actually behind the cameras today. She is the technical director for the day. Yeah. She would love to send you a gift. We will all sign it, including Jack yeah. and Noah. Yeah. Because we love you guys. Yeah, and if you're like some of you, my friends, they'll send you a photo of me on their fridge. <laughs> it's kind of a strange thing. Um, also today, because yes. in this whole death and resurrection series, mm -hmm. if you've been with us through the series, you know we take communion every Sunday. So yes. you may want to go ahead and hit pause, get your elements together, whether that's grape juice and a cracker or, I don't know, leftover something. Something. I don't know. I don't know. Can you do communion with like leftover pasta? Bread, I suppose. We're about to get into worship right now. The first song is You Deserve It. Our mm -hmm. Lord, our Jesus, our God who came down and died for us deserves all our all praise. Yeah. So whatever you're doing, stop right now. We are going to praise our Lord. Let the neighbors know that you are excited to praise your God. Join us in worship.
All right, Mercy Church, how are we doing? Oh, my goodness. Wow. Uh, hey, it is good to see you. We need to try that again. How are y'all doing this morning? All right, listen. Hey, we are in a series uh, called Death and Resurrection. Uh, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to die? Because I think what happens a lot of times when we uh, start following Jesus or we're introduced to Jesus, that question comes up, right? Like, why did he have to die? What was going on? What was so bad about us? And we needed in this series to answer that question, why did Jesus have to die? And so as we've been working through uh, the book of Luke, what, where we are right now, if you're new with us, um, where we are right now is we are rapidly approaching the cross. We are rapidly approaching the cross. Uh, Jesus' best friends have deserted him. Uh, they are gone. They are nowhere to be found. Uh, Peter just denied Jesus. Judas betrayed him with a kiss and then led him to, uh, to, to, to just being arrested. And right now in this moment, Jesus, he has been shackled and he is about to go to court to be tried for treason, for all these different lies, this kangaroo court of trumped up charges. And if you're like me, when you first heard this story or you're hearing it maybe now for you for the first time or you're being reintroduced to it again, it's almost like we get this feeling like, what is going on? Like, how could this happen? This is God. How is God arrested? The one who spoke things into creation, the one who upholds things by the word of his power. How is God in chains right now? Yeah. It's disorienting, it's confusing. And as I was thinking about this passage and I was like, I was reading it, I started feeling like this is chaotic. I get, I totally get why the disciples would have been like, yo, I am out. Like, like everything's falling apart. Nothing was what I thought it was. Everything's ruined. I'm gone. I'm going back to fishing. But what we see in this passage is actually it's not chaos. It's design. It's God's design. But in the midst of this chaos, as I, as I was feeling this, and as I was reading, I was reminded of a book I read, uh, gosh, it was probably last summer. It's called, uh, it's called We Germans. And it's a book, um, basically it's about, it's his biography about this guy um, who he was a Nazi officer. And his grandson asked him the question, how could that have happened? How could you have been a part of something like that. You're my grandfather. You're the most loving person I know, but I also know what you did. How could that have happened? So he goes on and starts writing in this. I didn't even finish it because I was like, this is too much for me right now. Uh, so so, so middle, middle of COVID, I was like, listen, I ain't in the right space for this right now. Uh, so I just stopped. But So if, if it ended badly, I am sorry. Uh, but listen, like that, you feel that tension though, right? Like how could that have happened? How could an entire nation just turn on everybody, start killing people? Like how did that happen? Chaos is ensuing. And that's kind of how I felt reading this passage. Chaos. What is going on? You are God, Jesus, yet you are in chains? That doesn't make any sense. And what I think it's showing us is just the darkness of the human heart. What, it show, what this passage is showing us is that we have been, we are desperately wicked. And we are capable of horrible things. And as we go through this passage, we're going to see different areas of disbelief. We're going to see different ways that we reject God. Because what we're going to see in this passage is that these people, they knew who Jesus was. They knew exactly who he was. Yet they chose to kill him anyways. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this passage. Because I think as we see Jesus' trial... What we're also going to see is that these men were on trial as well. And we are on trial this morning. And we're going to have to answer the question, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with Jesus now that I know this, now that I've understood the gospel, now that I know what Jesus has done, what am I going to do with this? Am I going to surrender? Or am I going to follow the world? Am I going to follow my own desires or am I going to lay them down? 
Am I going to pick up and run after approval? Or am I going to care more about his approval? And I think what we're going to see in this passage is that God died for people like this. Like you, like me. Let me pray for us and then we'll jump in. Uh, God, we love you. Uh, This morning, Lord, I pray that as we walk through this passage in Luke 22 and 23, God, I pray that you convict our hearts, Jesus. Lord, I pray that not only do do you convict our hearts, but also, God, that you show us that because of the great love with which you loved us, you endured the cross. People like the people in this story, we are like them, yet you still love us and you still care for us, so much so that you went to the cross. And God, I pray that you help us to lay down every weight, to cast aside every burden, to look upon the word of God that you have given us, to see you for who you are. It is a king worthy of worship and praise. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what we're going to see in this passage today, we're going to start in Luke, uh, Luke 22. Uh, verse 66. Uh, we're going to see a couple of things. We're going to see that we're going to see ways people reject Jesus, different ways that people reject Jesus, because each one of these people who are putting Jesus on trial, we see some very common things in their hearts that we also see in our hearts. And then after wrapping it up, we're going we're gonna to see that this actually isn't chaos. This is actually the loving plan of God. So we're going to see those two things, ways people can reject Jesus, and we're also going to see the loving plan of God. So if you will turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to read verses 66 through 71, and then we'll dive in. When the day came, the assembly of elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes. And they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of God, with, uh, of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say I am. Then they said, well, what further testimony do we need? We've now heard it from his own lips. All right, so right now, again, Jesus, he is in the courtroom. Uh, They have brought him in shackles. He's just been, you know, Peter just denied him. They brought him in. And what we see in verse 66, the day came, the assembly of elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes. So here's who those people are. This is the Sanhedrin. Okay, this is the Sanhedrin. These are the people, basically this is the Supreme Court of Israel, right? These are the same scribes and priests that have been trying to get Jesus imprisoned for the last three years, but they haven't been able to do it. Right, Jesus somehow outsmarts them or, or, or sovereignly like the, the crowd surrounds him and all of a sudden he's not even there anymore. Like, like all these crazy things are happening. They're not able to pin him. But finally, they now think they have him. They've got him. This is the chief priests and the scribes of the Supreme Court, the religious, the elite, the people that walk around thinking that they have it all together and everybody else is just the worst sinners possible. That's who these chief priests and scribes are. And they led him to their council, to the Sanhedrin, and they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name right? It's not Jesus' last name, Christ. No, Christ is a title. It means Messiah, the promised one. So when they say, if you are the Christ, tell us, what they're asking him is, hey, are you, are you saying that you're the Messiah, the promised one, the one that we've been waiting for? Is that who you're saying you are? And he said to them, even if I tell you, you will not believe. Even if I told you, you would not believe. Now, curious answer from Jesus, right? Like, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe. Why? Because he knew that their hearts were already hardened to him. Their hearts were already hardened to him. And they knew even if he did reveal himself to them, which they already knew who he was. We'll see more about that in a minute. Jesus knew their hearts. He knew that they wouldn't respond to him anyways. 
And he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So he goes and he says, but from now on, the Son of Man. Now, if you were with us, you know, I guess probably a year ago, right? The book of Daniel. Uh, we talked about the Son of Man. This is the title of the promised Messiah. So he said, even if I told you, you would not believe, but be assured the Son of Man will sit at the right hand of God. So then they go and he say, okay, are you saying that you're the Son of God then? And he said, you say I am. Now, in the Greek, this is an interesting way. Like, there's a, if you look at different tra- English translations, like, they translate it a bunch of different ways. Basically, he is saying, yes, I am the Messiah, but really he's kind of saying, you already know that. You say that I, you already know this is who I am. Now, this is pretty interesting because if you go back and you look throughout, this is why I love the Bible, because the Bible helps you interpret the Bible. You go through and you look at who these chief priests are and who these scribes are, and what you realize is that they already know who Jesus is, and Jesus already knows who they are. Flip over with me really quick to Luke, uh, sorry, to Matthew chapter 2. Let me hear those pages turn. In Matthew chapter 2. So here's what happened, okay? So Jesus has been born, and now the wise men have come in this large caravan, and a bunch of people have come, and Herod, Herod the Great, heard about this large group of people, and they're saying, wait a minute, there's this Messiah that's supposed to come? And then verse 3 of chapter 2, Herod heard this news, and he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling, who did he assemble? All the chief priests and scribes of the people, and he inquired of them, where was the Christ to be born? And they go on and say, he's to be born in Bethlehem from the tribe of Judah. So Herod, these same people, these are the ones that predicted and knew from Old Testament prophecy where Jesus was to be born. And these are the same chief uh, priests and scribes who told Herod, hey, this is where he's supposed to be born. So they know who Jesus is. They know exactly who he is. Not only that, he fulfilled something like 350 prophecies throughout his life. And these chief priests and scribes were required to have the Old Testament memorized. So in real time, they are seeing the fulfillment of these prophecies, yet what we see is that their religion, their, what they care about, their works, all these things are blinding them. They know exactly who he is, but he knows who they are. They've been hardened against him from the beginning. Jesus had to flee to Egypt as a political refugee in order to get away because Herod went on and then killed the first I guess it was the first two years, like every boy from two years old under, just to make sure. They know exactly who Jesus is. They already know. And then he said, you say that I am. They know exactly who he is. And then they said, what further testimony do we need? We'd heard it from his own lips. So they know who he is. These people, they're blinded by their religion. They're blinded by their works. They care more about uh, appearances than anything else. And now Jesus is a threat to their kingdom. He is now a threat to their kingdom. Now, before we scoff at these religious people, we are just like them at times. We are just like them. Let me show you a few ways that we are. So how to know if you're rejecting Jesus through religion. That's kind of how I want us to think through that. All right, here's the first one. Like these scribes and Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, you care more about appearances than holiness. You care more about how you look or come across as godly than you actually being godly. Instead of giving yourself to the sanctification process of of the Lord and, and giving yourself to that and casting your eyes on those things, you work to appear godly rather than actually being godly. That's what these people did. You know, secondly, you're more concerned with the sin of others than your own. You're concerned more about the sin that you see in other someone else's life than the sin you see in your own life. I think we all get into that Sometimes, right? Because here's one thing that's hard, is that people are hard to love, right? 
our family members, uh, you know, our spouses, our kids, our friends, we are hard to love because the sin, their sin is ever before us. We are affected by their sin all the time, but our sin affects them all the time too, right? And I think one of the things that we see in the, in, in the Sanhedrin and in the Pharisees and these chief priests and scribes is we see legalism. You know, earning your way to God, following all of the rules, you know, fasting and throwing dirt on yourself so you, oh man, I've just been fasting all week, you know, like I'm so godly and you're not, you should be like me. And, you know, and, and, and what's crazy is that what's true with the Pharisees and with these folks and in our lives is legalists almost always have the most hidden sin. Legalists almost always have the most hidden sin because they're so preoccupied with their own sin and making sure that they appear godly that they project a kind of godliness that's not actually true in their own heart. So in order to seem godly, you have to think down on other people because if you think down on other people, then you think better about yourself and you wouldn't have to really think through and dive deep on the reality of the wasteland that you probably actually are. And listen, I am right there with you. Like, I have a tendency to think, like, man, I am, I, I think I am better than that person. Because I get insecure about how God actually views me. Whenever I get insecure about how God views me, and I forget that he is a good, loving father that loves me, and that my sins have been forgiven because of the cross of Jesus and the power of the resurrection, if I take my eyes off of that, I run to legalism. I run to religion. I run to doing more than the next person. Can you relate? The next one is you think your knowledge of God will save you. You think your knowledge of God will save you. You know, a lot of us, the, again, these chief priests and scribes, they had the entire Old Testament memorized. If anyone was supposed to see the Messiah for who he really was, it was these people. They knew everything about the Messiah. They knew what he was supposed to be, you know, but instead they, they changed it for how they wanted it to be. They were tired of being under the rule of Rome, and, and now they wanted a political leader that was going to come and, and, and get them out, and they, they made God into their own image and what they wanted him to be. You think you're, they, think, they thought their knowledge of God would save them, they'll, they'll be okay, and we can also think that as well. And here's the scary one, I think. This is the scary one, is that you are familiar with God but not surrendered to him. You're around the things of God. You've been around the things of God your whole life. You're familiar with all the things, the verses, the, the VBS that you went to, the, all sorts of things, yet if you actually think about it, you're, you're not surrendered. You're not surrendered to Jesus. And like these people, you know, there is a warning for you today. What are you going to do with Jesus? So we move on into, into uh, chapter 23. And what we start to see here is we're going to be introduced to a new character. We're going to be introduced to a new character. We're going to see Pilate. Pilate. And then through his life as an example by way of application, we're going to see that people reject Jesus through pride and fear. We're going to see that Jesus rejects, or sorry, people reject Jesus through pride and fear. Uh, let's read uh, uh, 23, verse 1. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and, forget, and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is the Christ, a king. Now, Pilate. Pilate was, is, is a Roman ruler. He's in charge of this district. He's in charge of making sure that everything is in, under Roman rule. And the crazy thing is that what, they're, what he's doing is, is, is these um, scribes and, and, and chief priests, they're accusing Jesus of a couple of things. One of heresy, right? They're accusing him of heresy, but they're also accusing him, saying that he's a threat to the state. He's a threat to Rome because he's saying he's a king. Right? And if this Messiah king is supposed to be here, he's going to take y'all out. Now, these are obviously trumped up charges, you know, that we see. Uh, we found him misleading the nation, which isn't true. You know, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. 
Uh, that's not true. We see in Luke 20, just like a couple of chapters earlier, that they're like, well, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And what did he say? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So, we, so these are not true charges. And then we go through uh, and, and, and we see that they're trying to just create a, a, it's a scare tactic. Because here's something we know about, about, about Pilate. What we see about Pilate is in the book of John and later is that he is actually really fearful. He's really fearful of the Sanhedrin. He's really fearful of them because how he rules in this area is going to be a reflection on his leadership to Rome. So what are they going to think of him? This, like if, the, if things get out of hand here, then my job's at stake. If things get out of hand here, what are people going to think of my leadership of who I am? Right, so he's thinking of all these things. And then Pilate, verse 3, says, ask him, well, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, again, you have said so. You already know the answer to this question. You already know. And then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man. And he's right. He, there wasn't anything to really charge him with. He's not really like this revolutionary king that's going to take over Rome. Like, like, he didn't even have any followers. Like, no one's around. Like, like what are you guys talking about? And, you know, he, he saw no evidence of putting him to death. But they were urgent, verse 5. They were insistent. They started to get angry about this. And he said, but wait a minute. He stirs up the people. And he's done this all throughout Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. And then Pilate's like, wait a minute, did you just say Galilee? Time out. That is outside of my jurisdiction. That's outside of my jurisdiction, so I'm going to punt this over to Herod because he needs to deal with this because this is outside of my people. So, so I'm going to punt this for a moment. Again, you see Herod, he's trying to like, I don't want to have to deal with any of this. Like he is fearful. And then you see in the book of John, if you want to read a fuller version of what's going on with, with Pilate, you know, the book of John is filled, like there's a lot more in this story. And what you start to realize is that Pilate, like these chief priests and scribes, he knew exactly who Jesus was. His wife, uh, Pilate's wife had a dream about Jesus, and she's like, hey, like, don't have anything to do with this guy. And then they, like, he started seeing all the things that were going on and all of the evidence, especially in the book of John, it's supposed to point you to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, and Herod is realizing, shoot, I think he is. I think he is the Christ. But he let his pride what he cared about himself, his kingdom, his career, all of these things get in the way of his actual surrender. He cared more about that than he did following Jesus. So he punts it. He punts it. And I think we can be like Pilate. You know, we can reject Jesus through pride and fear. So here's how you know you're rejecting Jesus through pride and fear. Number one, you care more about the approval of man than the approval of God. You know, your mind, you know, instead of constantly thinking and being drawn to the ways that God thinks about you, the way that he has gifted you, the way that he has blessed you in life, what our minds tend to go to is what are people thinking about me right now? What does my boss think about me right now? How do my coworkers think of my leadership? Like, do people think I'm a good person? Like, am I God? Like, like, and we just go back and forth and we get all anxious and worked up like Pilate because all we do is think about the approval of other people. You know, you, secondly, you fear uh, what your association with Jesus or the church will mean for your reputation. Pilate didn't want that reputation. <laughs> he didn't want that. And then you see, uh, thirdly, you see that you think you're going to lose more than you gain. You know, all of these things are an over-hyper focus on ourself and self-preservation rather than sacrifice because of who Jesus is. So Pilate punts this responsibility. He's like, you know what? Nope, like that's not in my jurisdiction. I'm getting this off of my plate. And he punts it over to Herod. In verse 6, we see when Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that, uh, that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time because it was 
Passover. Um, so he was in Jerusalem at the time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. What an odd, like, what an odd statement. He was very glad. Well, why was he glad? Because he long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some kind of a sign done by him as if he's some kind of a court jester, some kind of a, uh, let me just do some sweet magic, some David Blaine stuff, right? Like, like, like that's what he's hoping. He wants to be entertained by God. In verse nine, so he questioned him at some length, but Jesus, this is chilling, but Jesus made no answer. Jesus made no answer. Now, time out for a moment. Did he answer the religious when they asked him who he was? Yes. Did he answer Pilate when he asked him who he was? Yes. You, he said, you say that I am. You already know, but he's, hey, the son of, I'm the son of man, right? You already know, but he didn't answer Herod. I think what we're seeing here is that Herod has hardened his heart. Herod has hardened his heart, almost like a, a Romans 1.18 example, like the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men, for who by their unrighteousness they suppress the truth. Because what's crazy about this Herod, this is Herod Antipas, he actually knows who Jesus is too. Because Jesus was close friends with John the Baptist, and then when John the Baptist called out this Herod about some marital stuff that he was doing that wasn't really so cool, well, who, what did he do? He killed John the Baptist. And this Herod's dad, his dad is the one who killed the firstborn boys, or he killed the boys, the two-year-old boys and under, in order to try and kill the Messiah. He knows who Jesus is. He knows exactly who he is, and he heard of all these things, and he couldn't wait to be entertained by God. He's playing games. He has hardened his heart. And what's so chilling about this, and my, my fear, you know, for like, like hear it for us, is that I do think that there are those of us probably in this room that you've hardened your heart to God. And there might be a moment when God doesn't answer anymore. Like Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you see over and over again, let my people go, Moses said, let my people go. And then Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his own heart. He hardened his own heart. And then at the end, God completed what, what Pharaoh already wanted. It said that Pharaoh hardened, or it said God hardened his heart. He completed it. Now, what's so chilling about this is that what, what, what happens is that we see that we can be like this. We can harden our own heart here to God. And here's just a few ways. One is this, and this might be you in this room. Like, if, are you antagonistic to God and his people? Like, when you hear about Jesus, does it make you angry? When someone shares with you, maybe somebody brought you here this morning and you were kicking and screaming, didn't want to come, but you came anyways because you love this person. And, but anytime they talk to you about it, you're like, gosh, would you just get out of my face with this? I'm done. You know, you might even play games with God. I remember I had a friend in, in, in college, you know, he, he didn't know the Lord and, and he knew that I was, you know, that I followed Jesus. And, and anytime we got in a car together, he'd say, you know what, Scott, I'm not going to wear my seatbelt because I dare God to kill me. And I was like, man, why? <laughs> like, why? You know, that may not be you, but, but is your heart bent towards like hating God? And then also you might question God to win arguments and not for the sake of understanding. You know, there is a kind of questioning of God, like, God, help me understand who you are. I want to give my life to you. Like, there's, there's things, I, 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 I just have these honest questions. I have these honest questions. But there's also un dishonest questions where we, where we batter people with questions like, we don't really want to believe, we just want to embarrass them because we might know more than they do. 
And sometimes Christians can be so like, we just, we know, like, like we just know God. And so sometimes we don't sit around thinking about all the ways that, that God might be real. We, we just know he is because we have a relationship with him. And you might be saying, well, I've asked you all these questions, but you can't answer my question. So this must not be real. And I just want to beg you, please, please, please. Of all of these, this is the one where I'm like, I'm like afraid because I don't want God to one day not answer you. Today can be the day of salvation. Please respond to him. And we're going to see more in a moment about how you can do that. But we move on and we see that Pilate is standing there watching as the Sanhedrin and as Herod parrot him around, they wrap him in, in purple clothes and they make fun of him. They, they, they tease him. The, you know, they're, they're making a mockery of this king. And they're rapidly approaching. And then Herod at the end, or Pilate, called them together. Verse 13, called the chief priests and rulers. And he said to them, you brought this man to me. And he's misleading the people. And, it, and after examining him before you, I did not find any, this man guilty of any of the things you've charged him with. And neither did Herod, for he sent it back to us. And look, nothing deserving of death has been done to him. So again, he knows who Jesus is. He believes in, like, this is God. He hasn't done anything wrong. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to punish him and release him. And then as we get into these next verses, 18 through 25, what I think we start to see is the unfolding of what's about to happen, which is the loving plan of God all along. The loving plan of God all along. You know, um, in John 19, at the end of this kind of trial, what we see is that, G or in the middle, uh, he says to Pilate, uh, he said in John 19, 11, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. So you might think that because I'm sitting here in shackles that you're in control, but in fact, no. The only reason that's happening is because God has allowed it. God has allowed it. And you start to see that the people started crying out, away with this man, away with Jesus, give us Barabbas. Because what they had around Passover is what, is what they would do, this tradition that got brought up is they would release one person every year, one criminal every year. And then so he's, so, so, so Pilate's like, well, I could, well, since this guy's not really, you know, guilty, let's just release him. But they said, no, give us Barabbas. Give us the insurrectionist. Give us the murderer and crucify Jesus. Kill him instead. And Pilate addressed them one more, again, desiring to release Jesus, verse 20. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And he said, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt. Now I will therefore punish him and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. Their voices prevailed in Pilate's heart. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. And he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, who they asked, and he delivered Jesus over to their will. They delivered Jesus over to their will. Now what's wild about this passage is that we see right here we see a sinner being released and the innocent imprisoned. We see the sinner released and the innocent imprisoned. Right? It's almost this picture like we get of Barabbas where Barabbas is being released. Like he didn't do anything, but he's being released. But the innocent one is being thrown in jail. And then he, Barabbas has the same option that we do. Barabbas has the same option that we do. Now, we don't know if Barabbas, after learning about Jesus' death and in his resurrection, we have no idea whether or not Barabbas gave his life to Jesus or not. We don't know. But what we do know is that we have the same opportunity that Barabbas had. We have the same opportunity. Jesus, the innocent one, went to the cross so that sinners could be released. The innocent one was scourged, flogged, the wrath of God poured out on him because of the great love with which he loved the religious. 
The people who would reject him because of their pride and the hard-hearted, he wanted to save them. We have the same option as Barabbas. What will we do with Jesus? What will we do? And as we get here, what we see in this, in this moment with Barabbas, and as we lead into the crucifixion, what we see that this isn't chaos. This is God's design. It's God's design for sinners to go free. It's God's design for, for Jesus to go to the cross for people like this. It's showing us the kinds of people that crucified Jesus. We are these kinds of people. We are these kinds of people, but we have the same option that Barabbas had. If you'll just bow your heads with me and I'll call um, the team up now. So you might be thinking to yourself, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with him? And I just want you to know that this loving plan of God from the very foundation of the world was put into play so that God would, could give you an opportunity to come to know him. Jesus lived a life, a perfect one, one that you and I could never do. But instead of, of, of repentance and faith, often we try to, 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 get, to get to God through our religion, to get to God through um, our works, and we focus more on others than ourselves. Sometimes we're prideful. Sometimes we, we, we think too highly of ourselves and we think that that will save us or that it will earn us favor with others. Or maybe you've hardened your heart this morning. Your heart's been hardened for a while. And I just want you to hear that it, no matter if you're any of these types of people, that Jesus loves you and he cares for you. And he wants to bring restoration to you. He wants the religious person to not have to feel like they have to earn it because Jesus did. He wants the prideful person to not have to be shackled down with the weight of the approval of others because, Lord, you approve of us. And God, for the hardened hearted, Lord, you want to break that heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh so that we can praise you. God, I pray for each person in this room. Lord, help us to see this loving plan that you have for us. And God, as we head into Good Friday, as we head into the resurrection, may we feel every bit of this. May we feel the weight of our sin, but also the joy of the resurrection, that you love us and that you died and that you rose again. God, we love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to, uh, wow, that was perfect timing on my sermon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're going to transition into a time of communion. So if you have the elements, uh, if you'll pull these out. Uh, if you don't have them, you can find some in the back. So these elements are meant to be taken by those who have given their life, surrendered their life to Jesus. So if that's not you, I just want to give you an opportunity, a moment to do that right now. All you would need to do is to surrender. Surrender. To say, you know what, I'm tired of living for myself and I'm going to live for you. I'm tired of fighting for approval because I guess I have it in you because you died for me. And God, I'm, I'm done running. I'm done running. I'm going to surrender. So all it would take would be just a simple prayer. Now, there's nothing magical about these specific words. It's more the posture of your heart when you say it. So with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I just want you to pray and say, Dear God, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that you live perfectly for me. And then I want you to tell him, tell him, are you the religious one? Are you the prideful one? Are you the hard-hearted one? Which one are you? 
and confess that to God. Tell him who you are. He already knows. And then ask him to forgive you. And then tell him that you're going to turn from those things and and that you're going to follow him. That you believe in his death and you believe in his resurrection, that he did that for you. And then there's the other person in this room that you've been following Jesus for a long time. And, and even though, you know, we see this passage and, and we see that this passage is filled with people that don't know Jesus, well, oftentimes believers, we can fall back into this as well. Are you thinking more highly of yourself than you ought? Are you worried about people's approval? Is your heart growing hard to God? Communion is a moment to reorder your heart. Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. It's a moment to remember the gospel. So when Jesus sat down with the disciples for a last supper with them, he passed the cup around and he said, this is my, or he, yeah, he passed the cup around and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So church, take and drink and remember Christ's blood shed for you. And actually before the blood, he actually broke the bread and he said to them, hey, this is my body, which will be given for you. They didn't really understand what was happening yet, but they were about to hours later when Jesus was crucified. So he said, hey, this is my body, which will be given for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So Christian, take, eat, remember the grace of God found in the death of Jesus Christ. God, we love you. And we confess this morning that we're tired of trying to be so godly. Tired of making appearances. God, we're tired of thinking about ourselves all the time. We're tired of what this hardness of heart has brought us. And God, we thank you for dying on the cross for those things so that we can be set free. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen, church. Praise the name of the Lord, our God, who uh, we'll be celebrating this week. Yes. Uh, this Friday came, died for us, and then rose again mm. and ascended to the throne at the right hand of the Father, who is interceding for us yes. continually at all times. Praise his name. Forever and ever. Amen. As in, I'm just like, yes, let's praise his name. And what about that sermon Pastor Scott brought in the word? Ah, oh, the trial, like you said, it's always intense. Yeah. And there's so much hope because of what is about to happen next. Yeah. Oh, do you want to remind us about the online services we have? Yes. Good Friday. Yes, we're coming we have up. Sunday service. We have extravaganza. Yeah, so Saturday. Easter weekend is here. It's, it's, it's well, I guess Easter week is it's here, but now Easter weekend us. starts on Friday. Um, we've got... Good Friday services at mm -hmm. Providence Road at 5.30 and 7, also online at yes. 5.30 and 7. On Saturday morning here again at Providence Road, we got the Eggs Stravaganza, which is at 10 a.m. Um, that's a family-friendly Easter egg hunt. So if your neighborhood's not doing an Easter egg hunt like mine, um, it's a great way to invite your neighbor say, hey. And even if your neighborhood is doing an egg hunt, it will not do it as we will do it. Just, right. just putting the word out. <laughs> you need to come to this one. Yeah, it's a just, great way to saying. get connected with other families here yeah. um, and make sure that we're keeping Christ in Easter, yeah. I guess. Yes, uh, Christ I, is is at the heart and center of Easter. And then on Sunday, of course, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, mm. 11 a.m. outdoors here, 4.30, nope, 4 o'clock and 5.45 at Northeast, which is our official launch. It was yes. exciting. And then online will be at 10.30 a.m on Easter Sunday. So a lot of options. Again, you can rewind, but really just go to mercyshallot.com slash Easter and you'll get all the news. One thing, if you are planning to come to Mercy Northeast, those are indoor services. So please, please, please mm -hmm. RSVP. I think that might rhyme. Yeah. Please, 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 RSVP. please RSVP. And before you go, <laughs> by the way, women, please remember we've got the women's gathering. What's yeah, when, April when is 14th. it? And what's the what's the website? Where do we get all the information? Mercershallot.com slash news will give you everything you need to know. Yes. And the women's gathering will be at 7 p.m. here at Providence Road. And I believe it's in person only. Um, so mercershallot.com slash news, you can get everything you need to know right there. Fantastic. If this was your first time joining us, please make sure you write your name on the chat. We yeah. would love to connect with you. We have a gift waiting for you. Let's do this again next week. Church, you're sent. You're sent.